Hey everyone, welcome to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about feature engineering. Uh, so feature engineering is uh, something that, that builds on our previous lecture in model building. Um, and, and in model building, we have all of this great data that we've cleaned and explored, uh, and it's just kind of sitting in a data frame. Uh, and, and we can throw this at a model kind of as a, a big pile, um, but if we, we really want our models to, to work well, especially our simple models, uh, we're going to get the most bang for our buck if we think about what features are important for our problem um, and, and construct uh, engineered features in a way where um, we're not asking the model to do a, a lot of heavy lifting, but we can, we can use a relatively simple model uh, and have cleverly designed features that will fit the data really well, uh, even with a, a simple model. So uh, the, the short answer of why engineer features is to improve model performance, to, to make your predictions uh, more accurate, more robust, and hopefully even more interpretable. So today we're going to talk about a, a few ways that, that we could do this. Um, firstly, uh, we'll, we'll do a, a little bit of uh, review and, and mention some ideas around uh, ways to, to format or transform or normalize your existing data or your existing features. Um, and, and this gets uh, into feature engineering, uh, even though some of the, the techniques we've talked about before, um, because what we're doing here is we're trying to create features that the model can uh, more easily or, or more effectively uh, interpret and, and turn into, uh, into um, model outputs with low errors. Uh, next, we're going to spend most of the lecture talking about uh, some ways to create new features. Um, this is, a, again, a, a really uh, problem-specific uh, type of, uh, of endeavor. And I, I know I feel like I say this every time, uh, but, but really uh, how you create features will depend so much uh, on what your data looks like, uh, what domain you're working with, and, and what uh, outcome you're trying to predict. That said, uh, like, like the times we've said that in the past, uh, there are some uh, tools that, that you can turn to um, or some, some ground rules that, that we can help give uh, some idea of where to start. Um, and then uh, finally, once we've built up a whole bunch of features, uh, we, we may actually have too many to be useful or effective. Um, so uh, so uh, next lecture, we'll, we'll get into uh, talking about uh, feature removing or pruning. Um, and actually, that, that may be a, a couple lectures down the, the line as we squeeze in some other topics um, into the, the first half of this semester. So talking about feature engineering, uh, this uh, is a, a pretty vague term and can include parts of statistical analysis and modeling. Um, and can uh, contain parts of pre-processing or, or filtering data. Um, so, so you may recall this slide from uh, the, the very beginning of the semester um, and, and where you uh, think about placing uh, feature engineering within this taxonomy uh, might shape uh, how, how you view this picture. Um, but certainly I can say that feature engineering is uh, one of the, the most uh, difficult and, and particular and, and sometimes frustrating, um, but, but also really fun and interesting parts of, of modeling. Um, and it's, it's both difficult and, and interesting because you, know, you have to learn a lot about the, the problem um, and really get a, an understanding yourself about, uh, about what's happening with your data and with your problem to, to really do this well. Um, so we, in that sense, some of the, the routines uh, take really well to automation and, and we can just run scripts with them. Uh, others take a little bit more time and thinking, uh, which, which can be a slower process than a lot of the, the other steps in, in data science and especially in machine learning. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, for the, the first few slides, some examples of feature engineering we've seen before. Um, and, and we'll build this uh, in the context of linear regression models, which, which are the, the simple models we've been working with so far. And, and like I said at the open, that, uh, that even simple models will be fine if, if we do a really good job of feature engineering. So, uh, so with our linear regression model, you recall last time that we had uh, two 
parameters, a slope and an intercept, um, and, and yet just one variable, uh, this, this scalar value x. Uh, so, so if you want to think about uh, what your uh, uh, data frame might look like to have uh, these two parameters, you could think about uh, you know, a, a dummy feature uh, just being all ones. Um, and, uh, and again, depending on, on how liberal you are with the idea of feature engineering, you could say that, that in this uh, simple example, we've already done feature engineering. We've created a, a bias feature uh, that lets you uh, that, that lets you um, have, have some constant value or, or some intercept uh, that uh, that uh, we, we can use in our modeling. And this is an idea we'll, we'll come back to in, in some of the, the more advanced methods like neural networks as well, where uh, bias inputs uh, actually tend to be to be really important, uh, as of course they are with the the intercepts here in, in linear regression as well. So uh, other basic types of, of feature engineering that we've already talked about. Uh, we mentioned uh, log transformations last time, uh, that, that this is a, a nice way of uh, taking data that, that isn't distributed in a way that, that is, uh, is pretty or, or makes sense um, to humans and, and squashing it uh, into a, a scale where the, you, you can see the variation in the, the heart of the distribution uh, a little bit more clearly. This is equally useful for models, um, where uh, models that, that uh, are, are data sets that have just a, a very small window of, uh, of variation uh, will end up being really sensitive uh, to, to the, your model will end up being really sensitive to that output within that window, and then it will be not sensitive at all to that input uh, where, where there's uh, not much variation throughout the window. So uh, it, it makes sense to have uh, as, uh, as uh, nice a distribution as, as we can for linear regression models. Uh, when I say nice, uh, ideally we'd have a, a normally distributed feature uh, where kind of the, the heart of the data is around uh, the mean, but there are reasonably sized tails on both sides. Um, we the the models also work well with data that's that's slightly skewed um, or with with uniform data as long as there's there's good variation uh, but the the gold standard is, is normally distributed data um, uh, and that kind of makes the implicit assumption that the the long tails uh, at the edges a, a few standard deviations away from your the, the center of your normal d distribution uh, are times when this feature is is really impactful. Um, and, and that uh, when it spends the most of the time at the, the heart of the distribution, it's not really uh, uh, distinguishing uh, that particular data point from the other ones nearby it, since they're all clustered together in the middle. Um, and, and this is uh, how we can think of a, a lot of um, data and, and variables actually being organized in, uh, in the real world. Uh, other transformations that we, we haven't talked about uh, that can get us closer to uh, symmetric or, or normal distributions um, are, are power transformations. Um, so this is a, a slightly broader uh, class of, of transformations that, that uh, similarly use uh, exponents to transform your data. Um, a, a couple uh, other specific examples besides the, the log and exponential um, Transformations we've talked about already for uh, for visualization um, are uh, reciprocal uh, transformations. Just looking at the the inverse or the reciprocal of your data, um, the the box Cox uh, transformation is a, a really nice one um, that uh, that has some free variables, so it's a little bit more complex transformation. Uh, but but gives a lot of, of flexibility and, and the the same for the the Yao Johnson uh, uh, transformation as well. Uh, talking about uh, uh, taking our, our data from a, a really wide um, set of of variation and and a, a wide distribution uh, and bringing it closer to to the center. Um, it, another related concept here is the idea of standardizing features. So we've talked about uh, standard units uh, when we're talking about standard deviation. Um, and it turns out that, that using these standard units uh, for our uh, model inputs is really useful as we've 
uh, mentioned anecdotally a, a few times already this semester. Um, so by, uh, by using these uh, standard units, a, a couple nice things happen. Um, one, uh, like we mentioned last time, where uh, the, the heart of your distributions uh, might, not be, uh, might not be evenly distributed across uh, the, the, uh, the, the distribution like we, we talked about in the, the log, uh, plot, uh, log plot uh, slide a couple slides ago. Um, that, that same idea uh, applies uh, for, for any sort of distribution. Um, where where we we really want to have um, have have variance uh, from the the heart of the distribution or from the mean uh, that that is uh, is standardized in in both directions. So uh, th that's to say that uh, when your variable is close to your other variables, uh, it, your your value of this feature won't particularly distinguish you from others. Uh, where uh, when you're far away from that, the heart of that distribution, um, then this variable being really high or, or really low valued uh, signifies that, uh, that this is a, a, a you know, different or, or, or unique uh, instance in, in your data frame. And so with the standard units uh, centered at, at zero and with a, a standard deviation, um, when, we, uh, when we multiply uh, uh, the zero, um, zero centered uh, uh, value by our parameter, um, when, when we're near the mean, we don't affect the output very much um, of our model, where, where this, uh, this uh, value is, is far from the mean, then, then we uh, have a, a non-zero value and end up really affecting the outcome of our model. So, so this kind of makes sense intuitively. Um, and then uh, standardizing just how far we mean when we say your the value of your feature is far from the distribution. Um, by having standard units uh, across all the variables, we're able to say um, say that uh, you know one variable is so far away from the mean um, compared to another variable in, in totally different units by uh, by taking away the uh, the range. Um, and the, the particular units from, uh, from each of those features and, and turning them into just uh, standardized units, uh, now we're able to, to compare across features. So uh, a particular example of this is consider um, you know, two features, one where uh, there's a variation from 0.1 to 0.2 and one where there's variation from you know, 1 to 100. Uh, if, if your uh, parameters are anywhere near uh, equally valued, any changes in the, the, uh, the variable with the small range um, will be trumped by any, uh, kind of any sort of variation, even tiny variations or noise uh, within the, the outcome or the, the output that, uh, that's from uh, the variable with a, a very large range. Um, and, and so uh, because of this, standardizing helps, uh, helps you uh, to equally weight or at least equally consider um, variables in, in going into your model. Another thing we've talked about before is removing outliers. Uh, so this is a, a pretty self-explanatory, um, but, uh, but uh, it is, is a nice way to make features more useful and, and more, interpretable, more interpretable to your model. Um, uh, especially if you end up normalizing too, that, uh, that the uh, outliers um, can uh, drastically affect uh, means and standard deviations in particular, which, which can throw off your, your normalizing constants um, or throw off your model outputs when you're, you're building a linear model um, that, uh, that assumes pretty small input differences centered around zero because we've standardized the units. And then when you see one that, that's really far uh, above or below zero, uh, your, your model outputs will, will make even less sense um, than, uh, than, than you might imagine, uh, given how far this outlier is from, from the rest of your data. So uh, like I said, uh, these ideas uh, certainly seem like they're related to uh, what we're talking about in feature engineering, where we're trying to take our, our raw data and our raw features and turn them into to features that are, are easier for the model to, uh, to take in and, and give more reasonable outputs uh, coming out of the other side of the model. 
But uh, we'll uh, we'll move on from this to uh, to talk about uh, some ways where we can create uh, create new features um, from our, our data set. Uh, and this should be the, the second bullet actually. Um, so uh, so other uh, other features. I Actually, this, uh, sorry, this was the first bullet. Uh, so, so the uh, other ways that we can make um, the uh, the the model um, uh, be able to read in in our inputs easier um, uh, are, are ways in which uh, we can uh, we, we can make our, our model more effective and, and more straightforward and and uh, and hopefully more interpretable, more interpretable while it's more effective. So uh, one example is uh, data that's input into to formats that aren't very uh, read friendly. So a great example of this are timestamps, um, where where date time uh, inputs tend to have these really long strings that are a combination of a, a bunch of different values, kind of all smushed together um, to to be a, a standard date time, where. Uh, if if you were to think about what uh, a, a computer model might actually look at when it's dealing with uh, a, a string of text like this, um, and, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail when we talk about text um, text analysis, um, but but it'll pay attention to certain uh, types of data or, or certain places within this format. So uh, a nice way to Make this easier uh, again, not uh, not necessarily changing the data, but changing the way it's it's formatted uh, and and fed to, into the model uh, is to take this string and, and turn it into uh, specific variables that deal with the the parts of this uh, of this date time that that you think might be important for your model, or if you're not sure which are important, maybe just all of them and, and see which ones the the model pays attention to. Uh, so uh, in, in Python, this is really easy. There's a, a really great date time package um, that'll uh, uh, read in strings of, of this format or, or similar kind of standard date time uh, date time formats, and and take uh, and create a, a date time uh, variable that you can uh, call attributes like the the year, the month, the hour, all the way down to the, the millisecond. Um, to, to pull out just the the relevant uh, tags within that date time, uh, so so this is, is really nice um, for making the the date uh, and the time interpretable to the machine. Um, but uh, especially paying attention to some of these columns uh, makes sense if if you have reason to believe uh, or if the model chooses to uh, consider uh, patterns that that just occur within that part of the date. So for example. Uh, if we're looking at a, a time and we expect some event to happen uh, once a day, then you could really ignore the the rest of the daytime except for the hour, um, the, uh, the 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 hour uh, unit. And so, by splitting the, this uh, complex state string into different columns for the different features, your model can learn to ignore all the columns except for the the hour feature and, and pay attention to that and, and weight that uh, heavily in your model. So this idea of, of splitting complex strings into separate variables uh, and, and encoding each of them, them uh, in separate columns uh, can apply to all sorts of other, uh, other uh, representations um, that, that similarly have multiple parts. Uh, so for example, an address, uh, you might want to break this into uh, different uh, columns and different variables for uh, the the house number, the street, the city, the state, the, the zip code, um, the the first five digits of the zip code versus the uh, the, the last four. Um, you can uh, you can imagine uh, you know different parts of, of that string being important for for different types of analyses, uh, or or just the the different types. For example, house number versus street name. Uh, you might need to to treat differently um, because they're they're different types of, of input variables. So to to expand on that uh, a little bit further, and and again, this is an idea that will uh, extend when we start to talk about uh, text data as well. Um, to to think about taking uh, a, a single column that that has a lot of different features built into it and turning those into separate columns. Uh, consider uh, a categorical variable that has a, a number of values. Um, 
So, for example, uh, the the passenger class in in the uh, the Titanic uh, data set here um, perhaps has a has a, a few different um, different classes. You know, first class, second class, third class, um, and in in this case, uh, maybe there is some linear relationship uh, or some ordinal relationship between the different classes. Uh, maybe there's not. You, you can imagine, you know, instances of different values of a categorical variable where there there certainly aren't ordinal ordinal relationships. Like uh, if the values uh, for uh, uh, color encoding were red, green, and blue, the the one uh, certainly doesn't necessarily follow the other. Um, and so so it's hard to uh, to have all of these variables, uh, all of these values, fall under a single variable. And what are the ways to, to break them out and, and uh, have a model be able to distinguish uh, each of these categories separately uh, is simply to have them as, as separate features like we mentioned before. Um, and so uh, what we end up creating is, a, is a, a binary variable that just says uh, whether or not that value is true. Um, you can think of this uh, as a, a dummy variable. Uh, it's also uh, sometimes called an indicator variable. Uh, to indicate whether or not that row has the uh, the column value uh, that, that you're interested in. Uh, a similar idea in the opposite direction is rather than uh, expanding features, uh, especially categorical features, with a, a one-hot encoding, uh, perhaps we have too many features um, and, and so what we end up with are, are very rare instances of, of each of our, our features. Uh, this can be a problem for a, a whole number of reasons. Um, firstly, if your training set has very few instances of, um, of a, a, a value, um, just a, a few rows having that value, uh, it'll be really easy to overfit a model to say that the the output whenever you see uh, an instance of a row that has this uh, column true should be exactly what it was in, in that one or two rows of, of training data you have. And that's a, a really good way to, to overfit to a, a particular instance. Uh, similarly, uh, talking about overfitting, you can also have the issue where your uh, your uh, test set only has a, a few instances um, of the, the variable that you have in mind, the, the value uh, that you have in mind, depending on whether it's a, a categorical or, or a one-hot encoding. Um, and, and so uh, if that's the case, then our test set isn't doing a very good job, uh, again, of looking at generalization performance uh, by, uh, by vastly underrepresenting uh, this value in our, our test set, um, and, and thus, again, being really sensitive to what uh, the output of, of that single row happens to be. So uh, a, a way to make sure that we have uh, a certain number of um, of, uh, of values for per um, uh, a cer sorry a certain number of rows per value um, within a categorical variable is uh, to to group small rows together. Um, so uh, th this is best uh, when when the rows make sense together. Um, and, and for example. Uh, if you're uh, we're, we're doing a, a project modeling people in this class, um, that there are you know probably uh, very few uh, and and actually not in this class that's a, a poor example but uh, but consider a class that's that's mainly uh, um, mainly upperclassmen but there's maybe you know a, a freshman and, and two sophomores um, and uh, to group them together into a single class that's, that's just underclassmen. Uh, maybe makes more sense uh, than, than to have those separately. Uh, in this case, with our uh, our material types in, in this example, uh, all of the others uh, just get uh, grouped together into one variable called other. Um, so, so this other variable uh, might not uh, actually mean something within itself or, or be very informative, um, but it's just a, a nice way to tell you um, that, that you shouldn't be relying on the information from any of the other variables. Um, and so while, while this, uh, this other variable may not be really informative in itself because of the, the diversity um, of, of actual values inside of it, uh, it, it does tell you, you know, not to pay attention to it that much and, and not to overfit to it too much uh, uh, 
you know, in, in particular. So uh, moving on to, to the next bullet point of uh, new features. Uh, so, so this is uh, perhaps the, uh, the artful and, and time consuming part of, uh, of feature engineering that uh, the people really think of when they, they picture, they talk about feature engineering. Um, and and the, the, these types of features are, are great for a, a whole number of reasons. Uh, most specifically that they let you uh, take any knowledge you know about the problem and, and turn it into the model. Um, but uh, also they, they let you look at features uh, within the model that, that might not be uh, quite so simple. Um, so, uh, so again, by having complex features uh, within a simple model, we, we can still represent uh, complex phenomenon. And I'll, I'll show some examples uh, here in a minute. So, uh, so the idea of, of dummy variables and indicator variables we've mentioned uh, in the, the one-hot encoding context. Um, there are other types of, of indicator variables that, that we might want to build um, that, that aren't just based off of uh, the presence of a single value in a category, um, but, but maybe we can build indicator variables uh, that, that tell us when important things or important events or important features uh, and, and attributes are occurring within our data set. Um, so, uh, so, so this is, uh, again, a really challenging thing to know uh, what the important features are in your data set. Um, this is, is much easier to do if you're uh, doing data science on a problem that, that you know very well, um, but uh, more often than not, you won't have the time to go and become a, a domain expert in, in some problem that you're handed. Um, and, and so the, the best way to do this sort of uh, domain infusion uh, is, is, of course, and, and as we've mentioned throughout the semester, to, to work really closely uh, and, and have open communication with the, the domain experts who are giving you the data. Um, so, uh, so, so like I've, I've mentioned a little bit uh, before, this is, a, is, is such a, a critically important part of, of your model building. Um, because uh, creating these uh, these problem specific features uh, is is just uh, so much more efficient and so much more effective uh, than trying to take uh, completely raw and, and uninformative data and, and transform it in a way um, where uh, where it makes sense um, and, and where you're you're pulling out uh, information that uh, that is relevant to your outcome. Uh, so so just as a side note. Uh, this is a, a, an incredible challenge of, of creating important features from, uh, from naive raw data. Um, and, and a lot of the, uh, the hype that we've been hearing about recently in, in deep learning is because uh, deep learning is a, a, an example of a machine learning uh, platform or, or model that is very explicitly trying to do exactly this, of taking in raw data uh, and building up the, the relevant features uh, for for a particular task, uh, so so all of the the uh, groundbreaking results you you see in that field uh, are because we that uh, that that group of of people um, and in that field has uh, uh, found a way uh, or, or at least uh, uh, has a, a method if you have enough data um, to build features that that are important. Um, so, so what, what we're going to take in this class is the uh, alternate approach, which is to say if we don't have really complex models uh, and we don't have uh, an enormous amount of, of data, um, how can we use uh, our, our own expertise or, or the expertise of others uh, to similarly make great features that, uh, that, that uh, like we have in deep learning, can, can get us uh, really fantastic uh, models and, and predictions. So, uh, so, so one example of how we might uh, infuse domain knowledge into an indicator variable uh, is a, a threshold, uh, a threshold indicator, uh, for example. So, uh, consider a, a case where um, you you have a, a, a real valued quantitative data point, um, and and like we've uh, looked at with the the histograms before. Uh, this uh, th this variable we've uh, normalized and standardized to have a, a really nice spread um, and to, to show kind of just how far away different data points are from each other. Um, but uh, but maybe it's not the case that uh, that every 
um, every uh, every little change within that variable is equally important. Maybe there are specific thresholds um, where uh, it's it's going to significantly change the output of our model. Uh, so consider uh, age, for example, um, as a, a, an example of this. So. Uh, you know, depending on what sort of question we're asking, um, you might uh, imagine that uh, that you might get drastically different answers from people who are above or below the age of 21, uh, or people who are above or below the age of 65, uh, where, where they really do fall into totally different categories, even though that's, those categories are with respect to a quantitative variable. Um, so this is a, a nice way to uh, to have a, a, a binary uh, categorical indicator to indicate whether or not someone is uh, is above this age or not, uh, which uh, which lets you ignore uh, kind of the the uh, the subtleties and the the differences which turn out to be mostly noise if it's the case that uh, that you know you don't really care if someone is is sixty seven or sixty nine um, that uh, as long as they're over sixty five. Uh, that that's what what really matters. Um, so you can think of lots and lots of examples. I'm sure with the the problems that you're going to be working on in in your class projects. Um, another uh, example, perhaps, is if you're interested in modeling uh, floodplains, uh, then maybe you don't really care about uh, rainfall that's under a certain amount because it's not going to uh, to cause any flooding. Um, so, so what you care about if you're looking at uh, at real valued rainfall data is maybe just whether or not it's enough to, to cause flooding or, or not. Uh, we can uh, think about uh, a similar um, idea with categorical variables looking for uh, when, uh, when certain events happen or, uh, or, or grouping together um, certain uh, certain values uh, that, that you might see in in your data uh, to create indicators of, of when important things are happening uh, so uh, perhaps an example of this is uh, let's say um, you were looking at street addresses um, and you had a, a, a column for street names like like we've mentioned pulling out before um, and you're interested in modeling some political data um, perhaps it's the case that uh, that if you're looking at, at voting districts, you can end up, you know, grouping uh, all of the streets together that fall into to one district, um, and and just flag them with a, with a, a binary variable for whether that house or that street is is within that district or not. Um, you you can think about this, you know, within uh, neighborhoods where you might expect, uh, you know, houses of similar value and and similar. Uh, incomes of the people living in them or, 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 or things like that. Um, you can think about uh, about similarly uh, special events uh, that, that take indicators uh, or, or that uh, that could use indicator flags uh, happening over time as well. Um, so uh, for example, specific events and times during the year uh, might might be important depending on on what it is that you're modeling. Uh, the the folks uh, in complex systems here who model Twitter data and, and sentiment of uh, of the the Twitter following uh, population uh, over time uh, tend to find that uh, that the sentiment of uh, how people are talking uh, changes drastically on holidays that uh, that people say much more positive things um, on on uh, you know uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas than they do on uh, an average day throughout the year. Uh, or if you're you're looking at uh, you know political tweets, uh, then maybe uh, days when there are political events are are really special uh, special points within some time series that that you want to be pulling out and, and treating in particular. Um, if you're you're modeling um, uh, uh, behavior of let's say contact networks on campus, then perhaps. Uh, you're interested in uh, in not kind of uh, particular instances of of uh, of uh, points in time over the year, but but date or time ranges. So, for example, you might distinguish uh, between times when people are in classes versus times when they're you're, you're walking around campus um, outside of class. Um, 
to, to indicate that, that those two are, are very different behaviors that, that are happening over time. Uh, so, so, so far we've been talking about uh, infusing domain knowledge about, uh, about uh, indicators within single specific variables. Um, but uh, one of the, the most, uh, I think, impactful things about feature engineering uh, is being able to incorporate nonlinear features through cleverly engineered features. Uh, so with uh, with linear models, we've kind of come in with the assumption that uh, that all of our uh, features are linearly correlated with our outputs of our model, and that's just by definition an assumption we make when we choose to use a linear model. Uh, but we can cheat that a little bit by uh, passing in features that that aren't themselves actually. Uh, linear uh, transformations of the data that we've collected, but but are very nonlinear transformations, um, which is to say that that they often uh, or or they can include um, dependencies on multiple features to get together. Uh, so uh, so for example, um, if you were to consider two categorical variables. Um, you could ask uh, maybe when uh, an event uh, is is triggered only when both of these are true. Uh, so so in the the first bullet point, if we're measuring uh, snowfall, may, maybe we uh, don't care um, about uh, about the the temperature out unless we're we're seeing uh, a, a predicted uh, amount of precipitation. Um, in, in which case, then it's very important whether that uh, that that uh, precipitation is is rain or snow. Uh, but uh, but we only, if we're measuring snow, then, then we only care about when both of these uh, these variables are true that it is below freezing uh, and, and we do have uh, precipitation. Uh, you you can uh, think about um, uh, uh, multiple feature indicators. Uh, that, that don't necessarily look for the presence of, of variables, but also uh, compare uh, the, the quantities um, in a, a, a quantitative um, uh, or, or more than one quantitative uh, variable column. So for example, uh, the, the second bullet point here, uh, if we were to consider house price, modeling house prices like you have in, in your assignment, um, perhaps it's the case uh, that uh, that the the number of bathrooms that you have and the number of bedrooms that you have in a house uh, both are indicative of uh, of the the size or the uh, the the list price of the house, um, but but maybe a special feature is whether or not uh, everyone has their own bathroom. So so whether or not the the number of bathrooms or the number of sinks um, or the number of half baths um, are are greater than uh, the the number of bedrooms, for example. Uh, so in this case, you're uh, you're creating an indicator variable for whether or not some relationship between two real valued uh, columns in your data set is is true or not. And uh, uh, you know, in both of these examples, you can see how um, particular knowledge uh, that that I have uh, about these two examples. Um, for example, uh, having uh, lived in, in Vermont much of my life and, and seen lots of snowfall, uh, I feel like I, I have some domain expertise about uh, figuring out when, when snow falls. Um, but you can imagine uh, you know, lots and lots of, of examples of questions where uh, getting to kind of the, the fundamental uh, causal reason why something in, in your system is happening uh, might take a, a lot more effort and a lot more digging and, and a lot more collaboration to, to get to the bottom of um, and to create a, a feature that, that accurately represents um, and, and is useful for predicting uh, that, that event. Uh, you can also think about uh, other uh, other um, uh, interaction features that uh, don't necessarily output binary indicators. Um, so, uh, for example, we can think of uh, applying any mathematical uh, operator to uh, to uh, two or more of our um, of our columns um, that that will tell us. Maybe something uh, really informative uh, about our problem. Um, so uh, you you know uh, you can uh, read the the sum and difference in, in product and, and quotient examples here. Uh, maybe an example is if you're uh, looking at uh, uh, subtracting two columns, 
uh, suppose you're modeling uh, uh, the proportion of times that a, a team wins or loses a, a basketball game, um, and you have data about the, the offensive and de defensive efficiency or the, the average number of points that a team scores or, or that a, a, a team allows, um, and, and those two things in isolation uh, might be, again, really important, but, uh, but perhaps you can find an even more uh, important indicator uh, by, by thinking of, uh, of looking at the difference between the two, um, whether or not uh, a team's offensive efficiency is, is good enough to, to overcome the, the defensive efficiency of, of another team. Uh, similarly, uh, another example here uh, with the, the quotient, um, if, uh, if you have uh, especially count variables, um, then looking at, uh, at the, the ratios of them uh, or the, the chance of occurrence uh, tends to be much more informative than the, the raw values. Um, so, so for example, looking at website traffic, uh, maybe uh, the, the total number of clicks that, that you get through um, is uh, is a, a nice indicator, but a, a much more useful one is you know how many times a, a, a particular um, box or, or feature in your website is clicked uh, relative to how many page views you have, um, or to to how much time someone spends on on your website. Um, so so uh, creating these these ratios is a, another really great way to uh, infuse some more specific information into your your features. Uh, we can uh, imagine uh, these features being as as complex as as you like, and and here's a, an example um, where uh, we can think of trying to represent uh, even one concept in in many different ways that that would have different implications for uh, for for how we think. Uh, 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 our system behaves, or in the case here of, of house prices, uh, kind of the, the psychology behind house buyers. Um, so for example, uh, if we're looking at, at how much people care about uh, the, the quality of schools, uh, you can maybe engineer a feature in the first line that says, uh, you know, how good is the, the best school within uh, a certain driving radius from the house. Um, but you could also think of, uh, think of uh, that feature um, maybe equally validly being represented as saying um, for uh, for each school, uh, tell me how uh, how far it is and, and how well it's rated, uh, suggesting that maybe there's not a, a hard cutoff of how far I'm willing to drive, but uh, but I'm willing to drive farther and farther for higher and higher rated schools. Um, or in the, the last example, um, that, that maybe uh, if you're looking not just at, uh, at the, the interaction of, of school time for, for your particular uh, children or, or self, but for the broader community, maybe what you care about is the you know, average uh, school uh, quality of, of schools within a certain radius of you. Um, so uh, so th this is a, an example I, I, I thought was nice to show uh, how how much freedom and variation you have even within what seems like a, a really simple indicator of of uh, school quality near a house you're trying to buy, um, and you can think of uh, you know extrapolating this to to more and more complex features um, that that uh, could uh, look at more specific um, and, and and more niche and, and more complex uh, engineered features. Um, just through, uh, through through any of these basic operations or, or combinations uh, uh, within them. Uh, to, to talk about uh, uh, in slightly more detail uh, the idea of model complexity, we've uh, kind of implied this within the last few slides uh, that, uh, that looking at um, at, at interactive uh, or, or features that, that uh, contain interaction between uh, between columns um, uh, create uh, more complex um, more, more complex uh, inputs into your model uh, to, to formalize that a little bit more we can think about uh, think about these interactive features as being higher order features uh, making your your kind of simple linear regression into more of a, a polynomial regression. Um, 
where uh, where you can consider uh, the the interactions of, of multiple terms together, or or in in this particular case of poly pure polynomial regression, uh, if you were to to interact a feature with itself, then then you're getting higher order versions of, of that feature, um, which uh, maybe make less sense when you're you're thinking about uh, uh, school quality and, and house prices, but are, are really good for modeling physical systems that that have higher order um, higher order operations. Um, that, that you commonly see in physics that, uh, you know, velocity is a higher order operation of, uh, of position while acceleration is a, an even higher order operation of that. Um, so, uh, so just to say that, uh, that uh, as we're uh, creating more and more complex features and especially when we're, we're creating uh, engineered features that combine multiple features together or, or a feature with itself, um, that, that's like creating higher order uh, methods, uh, even though what we end up doing is, is training them still with uh, our basic uh, linear regression model, which uh, trains very simply and, and, and very, very quickly. Um, uh, in addition to kind of just the basic numeric operators that we've talked about so far, in, in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, uh, you can think about uh, other um, other uh, mathematical functions and, and especially geometric functions being really important for creating patterns within your data. Uh, so you, you can think of lots of examples where the, the modulus, uh, modulus uh, operator uh, could be really handy. Uh, so the, the example here I give is, uh, is for bus queue times, that, that if you're thinking of how many people, are, or if you're thinking of how long a person might wait in line, um, one of the, the things that, that you might care most about is how many buses need to come before they, they can uh, get on one. Um, and so, so you might uh, take the, the modulo of the, the number of people in line with respect to uh, the, the size of the, the bus or, or taxi that's, that's coming. Uh, you, you can think about this uh, similarly happening, happening with, uh, with days of the week that, uh, that looking at, uh, at the, the modulus um, of, of dates can can tell you uh, something that that has cyclical patterns like uh, like like days or um, or, or weeks. Uh, another example here is uh, is that uh, don't forget uh, modulus two uh, is a really nice way to to quickly uh, have even or odd features, um, which uh, could be uh, could be really useful. So uh, to go back to the uh, the example we used in in the assignment of of predicting home prices. Uh, maybe uh, if you're looking at uh, at uh, a road near Lake Champlain, uh, the difference in price between uh, a home on one side of the road with the, the even numbers that that has lake frontage versus the uh, the other side of the lake on, with odd numbered odd numbered houses uh, that that doesn't have direct access to the lake uh, could end up having a, a huge impact on on the price of of those properties. Um, so uh, just uh, yeah, yeah. Keep in mind uh, this really nice use of uh, of mod two, um, and uh, again, getting back to the uh, the more physical models um, that uh, that thinking about uh, geometric functions like sine and cosine, uh, tangent, hyperbolic tangent, uh, absolute value. Uh, where we have uh, specific patterns and, and shapes within those transformations uh, can be a nice way to create those shapes within your data. Uh, so for example, if you were to think about uh, patterns during the day, uh, maybe uh, taking the, the cosine of your hour uh, on a 24-hour scale uh, might uh, have uh, pretty low values in the beginning and then peak in the middle and, and come back down towards the end of the day. And that might be a, end up being a, a really good proxy for things like sunlight or, or temperature um, if you're, you're dealing with some, uh, some uh, ecological or in environmental modeling problem. Um, so, uh, so, so keep in mind uh, kind of how how each of these transformations look and, and uh, you know, like I said, this uh, this data science life cycle really is a cycle. So if you uh, go and, and engineer a bunch of features, you know, make sure that, that you're going back and, and doing uh, an exploratory data analysis on those features to, to make sure that, that you are uh, actually uh, incorporating the, the types of patterns and, and have well-behaved features uh, at the other end too, uh, where, where it would be really clear to see, for example, uh, 
how uh, how this um, the, this this temperature or or sunlight feature uh, actually looked over the course of the day, and, and making sure that you know you really did have peaks uh, around noon, or, or uh, maybe they have to be offset if you if you're looking at uh, uh, maybe water temperature that, that has more of a delay than than air temperature does. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to wrap up the, the lecture here because it's it's getting pretty long, and uh, I know I've also thrown a, a lot of plain text at you rather than pictures, which I, I, I don't particularly uh, enjoy doing. Um, but uh, I thought uh, uh, the examples here were, were really helpful and, and, uh, and much more so than me kind of giving really broad and, and ambiguous advice about feature engineering and, and why it's good or useful. Uh, but but to, to think about and, and really start to envision what specific features or transformations um, or, or indicator variable types you might want for your own projects and, and going through examples um, hopefully is is informative um, and and uh, you know gets gets you thinking about uh, what sort of feature engineering you might want to do for your problem. Um, so so for the sake of time, I'm going to cut it off here um, and talk more about uh, pruning and, and removing features in a, 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 a subsequent lecture. Um, so, uh, so just to, to recap, we've talked about how uh, some of the existing um, existing methods for uh, for scaling and transforming and, and just cleaning data um, you could imagine uh, defining as basic types of, of feature engineering. Uh, but we spent most of today going into kind of specific types of, of transformations and and strategies that you might want to go uh, and, and explore when you're thinking about how to build features in your data set. Uh, all of this with the, the big asterisks, of course, that, uh, that to really create features that represent the, the fundamental properties of your system, uh, you really need a domain expertise or, or a collaboration with a domain expert um, in, in that system. Uh, and then to, to wrap up uh, getting into implementation, which uh, I, I know I uh, purposely don't talk about that much in, in these lectures, um, uh, scikit-learn, uh, along with having nice uh, uh, methods for models and, and basic transformations, also has a, a sum of the, the things that we talked about in feature engineering, uh, like one-hot encoding, um, as uh, pre-processing uh, methods um, within that, that package. So uh, just a little plug to, uh, to check that out. Um, if, uh, if, if you're interested in uh, especially automating some of these, these feature engineering processes, uh, though, though often I'll, I'll say that kind of doing them by hand is, is a nice way to make sure that, that you're understanding what features it is that, that you're pulling out um, or, or putting together. Um, so uh, to, to wrap it up there, um, this uh, I, I hope was a, an informative and, and interesting dive into feature engineering. Um, and and uh, like all the concepts in this class, I think will become a lot more concrete and, and hopefully a lot more fun as you uh, use this in your own projects. Um, and, and I think this, this will be a, a big part of, of many of your projects. So I'm uh, excited to, to see the, the creative juices start flowing and uh, and to see what sort of features and, and uh, relationships you end up finding in, in your own data sets. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll talk to you uh, next time um, and, uh, and see you online.